Hello, welcome to Culture and Causation. I'm Aaron Briley, and I'm excited to have my guest today. He's a philosophy professor, writer, iconoclast, advocate for freedom, and someone who deeply appreciates the American values and the American dream, and he is Dr. Jason Hill. Jason, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Aaron. Great, thank you for being here. <clears throat> now, you have a perspective on America that I find truly inspirational. You immigrated to this country from Jamaica with only $120 in your pocket and became a university professor who has authored numerous books and even more articles. Um, so can you please share your story? Uh, specifically, what was your motivation to move to this country and what role did Ayn Rand play in your journey? Right, well, you know, I had always been in love with America uh, from as far back as I can remember, uh, which was probably around the age of three and a half, four. And uh, Jamaica is a very small country and uh, I had, you know, great aspirational, aspirational ambitions from as far back as I could remember. I wanted to be a writer. I know it's my family, I wanted to be a writer at the age of, of 10 and much to my mother's dismay because she thought I was going to be, end up in poverty. And, um, and, and started writing really, really early on in school. And, and my mother decided that um, it, was, it was going to be possible, but we didn't really know how yet because she had given up our green cards, uh, which we had as children. And um, so when I turned, uh, after I'd finished school, I went to an, uh, an English school in Jamaica. Uh, it was based on the English system. I finished my O-levels, I went to do my A-levels, which would be sort of like the equivalent of an, uh, a community college to get an associate degree. My brother and I decided we wanted to come and my mother thought we were way too young. I was 20 and, and my brother was 19. So she came along with my 72 year old grandmother to give us moral support. And, um, and I came because Jamaica is a very, very small country. At the time there was only one university and I was at the time working for the largest newspaper in the Caribbean as a reporter. And uh, there weren't that many newspapers, one newspaper and uh, one university. And I, I had designs, I wanted it to be a big fish in a big pond, not a big fish in a little pond. Mm -hmm. That was extremely, extraordinarily ambitious. And um, so the decision to come had been set many, many years before in my mind. And thanks to my mother who facilitated much of that journey by sponsoring, my grandmother had sponsored my mother to get a green card and I acquired one along with my brother. And then I discovered Ayn Rand when I was shortly before I left Jamaica, maybe, I didn't discover Ayn Rand till I was around 19, uh, the year before I left Jamaica. And the idea of becoming a philosopher, I knew I wanted to be a writer and I knew I wanted to get a PhD more likely in philosophy or that ghastly subject now, literature, which I have a double major in, uh, to have gotten a PhD in literature would have been a mistake. Um, but I decided when, after having read Ayn Rand, well, I first read The, the Fountainhead, and I didn't like it at first, I have to tell you. I found the characters very abstract. So a friend of mine said, why don't you try Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology and the Romantic Manifesto? And I read her nonfiction first which I fell in love with. And then I went back to the Fountainhead with a new perspective of reading literature through the prism of the Romantic Manifesto. And I fell in love with the characters. Then I went on, in fact, en route to America, I was reading Atra Shrug. And Rand gave me the kind of confidence to really uh, not just become a philosopher, but on that flight over, Darren, I must tell you, I mapped out my life as a young 20 year old man. I said, I will, uh, take two years to work to put myself through school. Then I will get a scholarship, which I subsequently did to do my PhD. And I will write my first book. I actually had my defense date mapped out for my PhD on that plane without even having had a college degree. I will write my first book a year after getting out of college, uh, uh, graduate school. And then I will write my second book on this date. I had about the next 15 years of my life planned out. And I and actually didn't miss anything. I actually accomplished my goals before my deadline date. So Rand gave me that sense of sense of life, that confidence, that the inviolability of my life, the, 
the, the, the capacity to make a decision and to set goals mm. and that your life is indubitably your responsibility, immutably your responsibility. Uh, it doesn't belong to anybody else. You're not entitled to anything else. It was a magnificent gift because when I came to America, I didn't come with a sense of entitlement. I came with a sense of this is my life. This is something sacred and that belongs to me uniquely. And so I worked up to 45 hours a week to put myself through school and went to school full time and graduated magna cum laude at the top of my class and then got a scholarship to do my PhD, um, which was a, a wonderful experience. One of the happiest periods of my life was getting that PhD. I did it in four years. And, um, but Rand also gave me a method of cognition, um, which benefited me enormously in graduate school, which is why I think I sailed through graduate school so quickly because the, just her whole methodology of thinking in terms of fundamental principles and the organizational way in which one organizes one's thinking and one's approach to ideas. Uh, you know, you could open a book and um, based on the premises, it was very, very easy to see where the argument was going to lead. So that's such a very short introduction about my life. I came from a middle-class family in Jamaica and um, uh, my grandfather was uh, a, a long line of communists, by the way. <laughs> my grandfather was put in a detention center uh, by the British government because he was a pioneer and should have been the first prime minister. And, um, but I wanted none of that. I was a, a ra ra rugged individualist uh, before I met Rand in her works, which is why her works were so amenable to my sensibilities and uh, despised socialism, thought there was something awry about it, having watched it destroy my country. Mm. And uh, yeah. Okay, well, that's interesting. So, so I'm actually curious, I just wanna actually maybe ask a question about that. So you grew up in this kind of collectivist socialist environment, but you said that you had this sense of being an, an individualist. Do you know where that came from? Do you know how that was ingrained in you? Well, I think retrospectively speaking, I think much of it had to do with two things. One is, um, part of me wants to say it's having a sense of being, I, I mean, I, I lived a heterosexual life until I was 30, but I, I had the sense that I was gay uh, growing up, but that doesn't answer the question because there are lots of gay people who have collectivist identities. I think what happened was that I was a voracious reader from about the age of three. And in reading, I was thinking very, very clearly about, because I think reading gives you a method of cognition also. So I was reading like 700 page novels by the time I was six. And I think it's through reading and identifying with characters and, and discerning and making distinctions and appraisals of, of, of the, the values of, of the behaviors of characters um, that I, that played a, a, a partial role in, in my becoming an individualist. The other part, Aaron, is I just think it's something quite temperamental that I, I, I had a very discerning mind that refused to capitulate to orthodoxy. Um, at 12 years old, I was suspended from a class because I said, you know, the, the Virgin Mary um, couldn't have conceived without something um, getting inside of her. And it was very diplomatic. And I said, and so, Joseph must have been the father and, and I was suspended and it's always asking probing questions. So I think some of it, I don't know where it came from, but I think a lot of it had, was forged in the crucibles of um, a, a, a person who loved to read and in reading, yeah. one can develop a set of sensibilities that require that one make distinctions and make judgments, value judgments, among other things. Not all persons yeah. who read develop these kinds of sensibilities. Some people just read passively. I was a very active reader. Okay. And now you've also <clears throat> spoken and written a lot, um, you, know, you know, very extensively about race and racism. And so I'm just curious because you had this, um, you know, your, your trip and your journey here to the United States was really this American dream. 
And so I'm curious how you respond to people who claim that we as a nation really haven't overcome our original sin, so to speak, of slavery and of racism. And I'm primarily thinking of uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates and people in that camp. So do you think that America in 2020 is a racist nation? Um, you know, that is, do you think that there is an anti-Black or anti-minority or anti-immigrant sentiment mm -hmm. that accurately represents the beliefs and feelings of most Americans today? Well, that's an interesting question. And I mean, there, there are factionless groups in this country, undoubtedly, that are racist, that are xenophobic, um, that are anything, that are homophobic. But the litmus test for me, Aaron, is the fact uh, that race is no longer a determinant of one's destiny, as it was certainly during slavery as it certainly played a significant role in determining one's destiny, say, prior to the 1964 Civil Rights Act during Jim Crow laws, where there were laws created by the nefarious state, a state against Blacks, not private individuals. There were laws that prohibited Blacks from entering certain professions, from entering certain universities, from barring Blacks from acquiring their dreams. That is not the case today. And those individuals, let me be, one cannot be harsh enough in saying this. Those individuals who think that there's no difference between United States circa Mississippi 1950 and 2021 really deserve to find out the difference the hard way. That is, I deduce, for example, myself as evidence of the utter stupidity and irrationality of that claim. Uh, I work at, I have taught at universities where 70% of my students uh, were in the Klan wow. and they had never had a black professor before. They had never received conceptual correction from a black man. And I stood there at that podium and I told them in no uncertain terms that you do not intimidate me. I don't care if you're in the Klan, bring your father and your grandfather with their shotguns to the school. You won't disrespect me. Uh, I come from one of the most violent countries in the world. So you, the, the this is child's play. Uh, the temerity of a black man to say that, and this was back in 1998, and to get away with it and to command a classroom and to restore order uh, could not have been done uh, even 30 years before that or 50 years before that. So do I think America is intrinsically, is still a racist country? I, I would have to say the answer is in spite of the various factions that we have in this society that are still racist, sort of a bloated totality or a utopianistic state which only small children believe in. There are always going to be irrational, stupid people, psychotic people, which is what racists are. But we have been growing progressively non-racist and non-xenophobic since at least the 1964 Civil Rights Act where Blacks have been granted full equality before the law uh, and have been, including, uh, have been included in the domain of the ethical and the pantheon of the human community. And that is widening. Look, I'm an academic and I've been in academia for 24 years and I see the progressive nature of this country in which um, if you are a Black person and you're in academia, especially if you're a Black man and you have a C average, they will send a jet plane for you and court you and dine you because Blacks are considered an endangered species. Okay. Corporations are subjected to sensitivity, racial sensitivity workshops where Blacks have to be treated really, really well. And affirmative action, which I argue in my new book that's coming out next year, along with the 1964 right, Civil Rights Act, which was among other things, a eugenics program, um, has, uh, they, have all, they have all in some sense been reparative moments in America's history that are that have become and are becoming much much more inclusive of blacks and other minorities in the story of what America is and what America is becoming. Now you've also spoken and written about <clears throat> the victim mentality that many blacks have and I think this is something that is both self-destructive and self-fulfilling. So, so given that, what do you make of this? There's, there's something called the talk, quote unquote, the talk <clears throat> that black parents give their children 
about the dangers of police brutality and law enforcement's alleged anti-Black bias. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, I think what's happening in the age of, of technology and, and cell phones is that more and more um, egregious acts against, like let's say unarmed Black men are coming to the forefront. Um, now, how widespread and how pervasive this is, and I've looked at some of the statistics which show that actually unarmed uh, white men are shot more than, than black men. It's just that the media seems to give a lot more attention to the black men who are unarmed, who are shot. There's a kind of statistical reasoning that is going on here. Blacks constitute, constitute I think, about no more than 13% of the population, but commit a disproportionate number of crimes. So I think there is inevitably going to be a sense that um, among whites and among blacks that when you have a minority segment in the population committing the vast number of crimes, that um, that population is going to be singled out and targeted. I think it is proper for any parent uh, to make his or her child aware of what he or she, she considers to be perceived threats. When that becomes hyperbolic and you start translating that into actual concrete actions, and what do I mean by this? Something like, well, I, I might fear for my child's life because he or she happens to be black. Um, and I'm going to take that into something like, translate that into something like defunding the police or indicting the police force as intrinsically racist, that law enforcement is constitutively by design in 2021, a racist organization. Not that there are not rogue cops, because we know there are, not that there aren't racist cops, because there are, um, and not that there are any cops out there who might target black people because they're racist. No, is this something that is systemic and endemic and part of the identity of law enforcement? I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay, and, and just so we can focus just on the, on the inner city black community for a bit, um, what do you think are the biggest problems in this community um, then that are obst obstructing social and economic mobility? Well, there are a couple of things. So there are practical issues and there are philosophical issues. So let me deal with the, the, the philosophical issues because I think that the, the practical issues often stem from the philosophical, the, the, the erroneous and fallacious philosophical beliefs that are held. So one of the philosophical problems um, that face that, that uh, one of the philosophical, some of the philosophical problems I should say facing the black community hmm. are on the order of, um, that the, procre the procreative choices that they make are not the responsibilities of the ones who make those procreative choices, they're responsibilities of society. And I would say this is one of the biggest problems that, th that such communities face. Um, the other problem is You're that- here about, <clears throat> just to clarify about single motherhood and fatherhood absenteeism, is that? That's right, that we're, then when 74% of, um, uh, births, uh, uh, when 74% of children born to African-American mothers are out of wedlock and more than 65% of those births are in poverty, are born of children born in poverty, there's a real problem here. And when you are incentivized to believe that your life is not your responsibility, that's your fate and your destiny, uh, do not lie in your hands, but lie in the hands of society. You're disincentivized from taking responsibility from your life. In other words, the government becomes a sort of surrogate husband, whether you're male or female, and you look to the government to be your caretaker when, if you're an able-bodied person, um, your responsibility is yours. Um, even if you're not an able-bodied pers person, um, the responsibility would lie with, let's say, family members or those who assume the responsibility for your life. 
but more pernicious and more nefarious than that, Aaron, I think is um, a group of intellectuals like Ibram Kendi, who wrote the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, Ta-Nehisi Coates, who is hailed as a premier black intellectual, probably should be hailed as a premier um, uh, liar of the, of the 21st and 20th century, 21st century, um, are pushing an agenda of anti-Americanism, anti-capitalism, they call it uh, racial, racist capitalism, that, would, that, that has the following effect. It creates an artificial chasm and dichotomy in Blacks vis-a-vis -vis their personal identities and their American identities, where what these thinkers are doing is they're foisting and force-feeding a diet of anti-Americanism onto Black people, saying that to be Black and to be America um, and to be a, an American are contradictory. So there's something inimical to your identity as an American that stands in contradistinction to being uh, a Black person. And I think this is part of what causes Blacks to have, it's not all Blacks, but a, a significant number of Blacks in the Black community to have an aspirational identity, to want to develop the best within themselves, to want to cultivate excellence in character. Incidentally, this was not the case, and I'm not an advocate of segregation by any means. This was not the case during Jim Crow. This was not the case during even slavery, where families were strong, communities were strong. Um, a lot of Blacks would not accept welfare because there was a certain sense of in pride and dignity in, in, in and being responsible for your life. Um, but we have shifted from that sense of self-responsibility and self-reliance onto a sense of entitlement where one does not need to cultivate a philosophy and an ethos that is directed towards self-responsibility and self-reliance. Rather, that is pushed onto, and this is part of what I deal with in my new book, to society. Um, the crime uh, has to be addressed, that there are certain pathologies within the community, there's a certain anti-intellectualism, well there's a certain anti-intellectualism that pervades American society and we find that the black community is just a, a microcosm mm -hmm. of that problem um, where to be successful and to be aspirational um, are seen as inimical to one's authentic Black identity. So if one speaks well, if one is a, has a kind of facility with the language and is articulate and aspires to be something remarkable in life, one is seen as inauthenticating one's Black identity. This is just a bunch of malarkey, but it's very, very pervasive. And I've seen it in the classroom uh, where to be dumb is to be cool. So we could talk, this could be a special show about the pathologies pervading the Black, black community and how Blacks, many Blacks, not all, I don't want to speak categorically here, but buy into this kind of thinking. It's a collectivist form of thinking because any, any individual who authenticates his or her identity according to a collectivist group script mm -hmm. is, is a collectivist by nature and is doomed to fail as opposed to authenticating oneself according to an objective individual identity that one calls for oneself, that is not a racial identity. Mm -hmm. So the whole notion of a racial identity, a strong racial identity is one that's very pervasive in the black community. Okay. And I think that's the beginning of the problem. Okay, and how can we inculcate better ideas in this community? Do we need to change academia? Do we need to have better role models? Is there something else that has to happen? What do you think? I mean, this is a very, a very broad question. So I know you can't, you know, you can't give maybe a, a definitive answer, but, but is there anything that, that you think we should be doing to better inculcate, uh, well, or to inculcate better ideas in this community? Well, one of the things that we can do, which, uh, you know, I have spent a couple of years doing is to discredit some of these black thinkers, uh, uh, who sort of garner a great deal of respect and admiration from black youth. People like Ta-Nehisi Coates who can, you know, saunter off to Paris 
uh, imitating James Baldwin to learn French. Well, you know, Paris, France was one of the biggest imperialist countries, but he says that America is the most evil imperialist empire. We were never an empire, nor a colonizer. Uh, but, you know, and Ibram Kendi and people like um, Dyson and Cornel West is one of the biggest ones who, you know, labels America as a neoliberal, evil neoliberal society. People listen to these people. So they need to be discredited, these thinkers. They need to show the liars that they really are because they are lying. They are, they are taking, um, twisting statistics to reveal things that just simply aren't true. They are um, committing, I would say, libel and defamation against America and painstakingly, and sometimes not so painstakingly, in very harsh and categorical language, then these thinkers need to be uh, called out for what they're doing and to show Black youth, especially, that it is not in their rational self-interest to hate the country in which they are matriculating, that if you denigrate America, it's like a plant hating the soil in which it's ensconced. Uh, this is the country that you're stuck in. You can't go back to Africa. Um, you're not African, you're an American. And so, first of all, discrediting the fallacious and nefarious uh, narrative that is being foisted on Black Americans, which incidentally is causing a massive cultural depression and systemic nihilism or nihilism um, in, and, and paralyzing effect on their agency. And in terms of role models, I do think this is very, very important because as much as a, of an individualist as I am, I think every individualist, I mean, I was inspired by Ayn Rand, I was inspired by other people in my environment. Rand says in the Fountainhead, you know, that um, a spirit can run dry and we all need fuel. The best within us, even the toughest of intellectual giants or spiritual giants, uh, need, we all need, um, not if not mentors, we all need models against whom we can sort of not just gain fuel, but build an, a, an emulative aspirational identity. So I think that the more that Blacks can see that there is an alternative to the sort of um, the mendicants in their communities, the beggars and the vic victimologists who think or who are encouraging Blacks to think that this is a rite of passage that you have to pass through to be a victim and to be a helpless um, non-agent and see successful Black people, including immigrants and, 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 and Native Black Americans who love America, who are patriots, um, that this notion of selling out is uh, a self-defeating, self-fulfilling prophecy, uh, who do not see bigotry and intrinsic racism, but rather see America as a country lined with gold and have taken a, a bit of that gold for themselves, uh, the, the better it will be for those youth, Black youth who are crippled by this victimology. That's great. And I also want to mention that you have a new book coming out <clears throat> called What Do White Americans Owe to Black People? Racial Justice in the Age of Post-Depression. Um, and I just wanted to know if you could maybe sum up what's in the book. I mean, do you, do you discuss these issues in the book? And, and if so, can you briefly maybe describe what's in the book and what, what, we, should, what we should expect? Yeah, I will describe it briefly. I won't tell everybody what the book is about because it's up on Amazon for sale. So I don't want to disincentivize people from buying the book. But basically, you know, I want Aaron to put the reparations argument to death. I want to <laughs> crucify it. I want to annihilate it. After this book is published, I don't want any Black person to be talking about reparations anymore. So basically the book, it's written against the backdrop of, you know, the governor of, 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 um, California just signed um, a piece of legislature that would put on record, uh, uh, make it legal for legislative uh, reparations um, procedures to be passed into law. California is the first state to do this. We're gonna see more of this happening. It's written against the backdrop that two things that because of ancestral affiliation uh, whites owe Blacks reparations, which is the most horrific form of what Ayn Rand would call biological collectivism. 
Um, and two, that because of something like white privilege, uh, white people exercising, entertaining, or enjoying the benefits of being white, that they owe black something. I show that in this, in this book that both are irrational, nonsensical, that it is a form of inverse racism to blame white people for the sins that their ancestors may have committed. In fact, most of the white people living today, our great majority of the white people today's ancestors came after the Civil War. Um, how do you prove that those whose ancestors didn't come before the Civil War were actually slaveholders? The whole thing is just messy and racist. And second, um, there are all kinds of privilege. I enjoy educational privilege. I mean, I have a PhD and I can sit in a, at a cocktail party and people defer to me because I have a PhD. Uh, am I, what am I supposed to do about my educational privilege? I have a lot of privileges as a professional middle-class educated man in this country. What am I supposed to do about it? Dumb down, cognitively dumb down myself and sound like a, 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 a you know, some sort of, farm animal. So the, the idea of reparations I want to show has been uh, at the root of um, the American conscience, con conscience since 1776. This is quite a controversial claim, but I show that 1776, although Blacks were not, there's no mention of race in the Constitution, by the way, but although Blacks were not considered full persons, the moral vocabularies were being created that would make us Blacks the legatees and the beneficiaries of full emancipation. So I go through the three foundings, the 1776, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, the Civil War, and the 1964 Civil Rights Act. I focus mostly on the 1964 Civil Rights Act because I think that was the great reparative moment where Blacks were given full legal standing before the law. Uh, and the affirmative action programs. And I call it a, a, a eugenics program really, because it really was saying that not only was it a violation of property rights, which one can understand given the, people might disagree with me on this, but given the role that the state had played in creating racists out of private citizens and the collusion between big business and small businesses uh, uh, and discriminating against blacks, that um, there's no more that a free constitutional republic can do for blacks after the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Any act of discrimination that can be proven belongs in a court of law. I see. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. I've really enjoyed this interview. And, uh, and hopefully when your new book is published you know, later this year, uh, I'd, I'd love to have you back on. Oh, thank you. Great. So, well, thank you so much, Jason. And um, yeah, this was a pleasure. Thank you. It was my pleasure too.